The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Sheila Walsh talks with Paul DeYoung about his new book, God, Money, and Me. If we can deal with the money issue, we can set up platforms where there is a paradigm shift of God at the center of it all, but God doesn't want us just to live in our here and now. He wants us to think about how do we live this generationally. Discover how you can create a life and a future of financial breakthrough and blessing next. Hi, welcome to Life Today. I'm Sheila Walsh. Now, usually you'll see me sitting over on the sofa um, on this particular set, but I had the opportunity to have a guest today that I know you're going to absolutely love. Um, we met he and his wife when Barry and I had an opportunity to be in New Zealand and just fell in love with this family and with this church. So please help me welcome Paul DeYoung. Paul, I'm so glad you're here. Well, it's our honor to be here. And you just literally flew in from New Zealand. Yeah, I arrived last night, so if we look a little tired, we are, <laughs> but great to be here. Before we get into, because your book, you have this book called God, Money, and Me. And seriously, before the show is over, I'm going to tell you, I think every family should have a copy of this book. And if you've got kids, they should have a copy of this book. But before we get into that, just tell us a little bit of background, like you and Marie, how long have you been building the church in New Zealand? So we went uh, 28 years ago. I'm a New Zealander by birth, Marie, Australian. And God literally tapped us on the shoulder, something we didn't expect, and we went back, put an ad in the paper, pulled out a guitar, and we started 28 years ago and have just seen God's smile and God's blessing really, in our nation, lift the value of who God is. And wow. it's been amazing to be a part of it. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, your book, God, Money, and Me, I honestly wish, I think I said this to you when we were in uh, makeup, I wish that I had read this book when I was a, a kid because I think it literally would have changed my life. What, what was the motiva motivation for you writing that, that book? I've been in church my whole life. And, you know, when people hear that, even the title, God, Money, Me, here we go again about money. But for me, being brought up in church, I discovered, in fact, 15 years after we had married, that we had nothing because we just kept on giving things away. And I realized that I had been taught on giving from way back when I was just sort of knee high, but had never really been taught on money. Wow. And so we found ourselves in a place, how would we ever get a home? How will we ever get ahead? Because there's always a need. And I kind of had this theology of, we don't know when Jesus is coming back, so it doesn't matter, just give it all away. And that was just echoed every Sunday, just keep giving. And really it sent us on a search saying, God, there must be more. Yeah. And we need to discover what is the answer because it's not working for us. Wow. Now you said there's a lot of myths within the church yeah. around money. What do you think some of the greatest myths are? I think one of the big ones is that we should give all our money away. Now, that sounds uh, spiritual, though. People say, well, does. isn't that a good thing to do? And we live that life because mm. that was all we heard. And this whole myth that if we just sow, harvest will come to our door. Rather than realizing when you begin to look again at the Bible, the Bible says a man ought to sow or a woman, we ought to give, but there is the law of sowing and reaping. Yeah. And I had never saw it as too... Uh, complementing laws, that there is the giving, but there's also therefore looking to make sure we have harvest. Uh, a farmer spends a lot more time in the harvest than he does in the sowing of seed. And I thought, well, we're giving and just expecting it to turn up at the door rather than going and getting the grain and putting that aside. I think the catalyst was, was really when I said, God, it's not working. And I, I find so many Christians living at a poverty line or living in debt and yet being generous. So we've got something wrong. Wow. And I felt like God took take me to 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And this is what that verse it says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you. And I said, so God, there is a grace for everything in my life. Yes, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. There's a lot of all in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll have an abundance for every good work. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that and that word sufficiency means the perfect state of life in which you need no extra aid or support. And I thought, no, we, we have to work just to eat. 
how do we get that if that's normal Christian living? And I think if we're all honest, it's kind of like we are, by and large, most of us generous, but how do we build something that will have all sufficiency wrapped wow. in the core? Wow. Now, I know that some of the statistics you quote in the book, I mean, you talk about 50% of marriages end divorce. It's because of financial disagreements, troubles. Um, 70% of newlyweds in the first year, the, you know, the disagreements are over money. Yeah. Why do you think that within the church, we have such a, p- a poor understanding of God's plan for money? I think we haven't stopped long enough to go that money's not a bad thing. The love of money. Yeah. And that can be when you have a lot or when you have a little, when money becomes the essence of everything we do. Uh, and so we have never gone deeper And yet God knows that here on earth, for the kingdom to expand, it's going to take money. For us to build a generational echo, it's going to take finances. And so the enemy, I think, knows the power of money. I think the church is a little naive. And if it's not working, surely we can stop and go, God, why do we stay in debt? And yet we are doing some things that the Bible says, but possibly not everything. You talked, you threw in the word generational there. And that was one of the things that really arrested me in the book. You talk about, I took some notes, money doesn't grow on trees. It grows on generational trees. What do you mean by that? Well, I never knew that I was called, Proverbs says that we are called to leave an inheritance to our children's children. My dad came from Holland, met my mum. She was also from Holland, came with 25 US dollars in his pocket at the age of 21. My whole life, one of eight kids I am, said to us, I came with nothing, it taught me some great lessons. You can start from nothing, it'll do you good. Even though that sounds right, the Bible puts it another way. Every generation should leave a platform for the next generation to stand on. So when it comes to money, if we just consume it in our here and now, how do we leave an inheritance to our children's children? We leave an inheritance of character, of godly understanding of the way that we lived our lives, but also financially. So you take that back to 2 Corinthians 9, 8, as I said, Mm -hmm. and you realize all sufficiency in all things. That means I don't need to go to work so that I can buy a house. I have the sufficiency for this life already cemented. I go to work because I'm called to go to work and to extend my ability to build the next generation. And I would contend in God, money and me that in one generation, your grandchildren will not have to live the life you had to live directed by money. And people say, well, money's not my God. Yes, but it directs all of our holidays, directs Mm -hmm. where we live, directs how we live and the difference we can make in others. So it really caused me to go, I've got to get into God's word and find some real answer of how I can live a different way. A generous heart I had always had. We had always lived that part. So there were parts of the equation we had right. It's a, I'm a pastry cook. Well, I was for four years. And you realize you need all of the ingredients yeah. to cause something to rise and to be uh, cooked and made that's really presentable and mm-hmm. people love to eat. If you cut the corner somewhere or you don't know, I don't have some of the ingredients in the cupboards, you pay the price later. Mm-hmm. I think that's the same when it comes to God, money and me. You know, it's interesting. Upstairs in my office, I have a couple of letters from people who wrote in and said, um, I've been tithing regularly, but I still don't have any financial freedom. And you say, I mean, you talk about that that in itself is not enough. Talk about your four jars. (laughs) I I love this. Well, I I remember when I, in the church, I was sharing around the whole God, money and me thought is there are 13 reasons I found in, in the Bible how you can tithe and not get financial breakthrough. Wow. So it's not just tithing's the thing. You honor God with the first tenth. We talk about that stewarding and that's important, but it's only one part of what I say are four ingredients to have a breakthrough financially and to be positioned to be able to create this generational echo and see 2 Corinthians 9, 8 become a reality for that generation. The first is obviously to honor God, to steward what belongs to God. So Mm -hmm. our increase, every time we increase, it's not an Old Testament law. It was in the Old Testament. It's an ordinance. And around that thought of God's first, that 10th, it really decides what spirit is attached to the rest of the money we have. The second thing we've been taught well in church is seeding. Mm -hmm. And that's where over and above 
sowing into our local church, doing it God's way, is seed creates a harvest. What I didn't realise was the third component, which was saving. Hmm. How we've got to go and get the harvest, and I now would say to people, you need to lock your seeding and your saving percentage together. That saving helps you buy a house. It's for anything that will go generationally. Wow. It's not for your retirement. It's not for a new car. It's not for a holiday. It's what will go into the next generation and then the next generation. And then the fourth one, which we think we know how to do, is spending. <laughs> Where I say, no, we, we need to restrict our spending, again, in this principled format as to what our income is. And then people say, well, I couldn't live like that and reduce it. No, well, maybe we need to work out other ways to get a greater amount in. We study a little more for seasons to get out of debt. We might even work a second job. Yeah. But those four things of stewarding, seeding, saving and spending. And I think I put it in the book. I think the ultimate goal would be to live, if the first tenth is God's, then the second tenth, if we could get to that, should be seeding because that creates harvest. Yeah. Then if that's a ten ten, there should be a third tenth ultimately, which would be that we are saving, putting into what will go generational. So if you're in debt, we're going to pay off debt first, then we're going to build it into our house, wow. and that's going to have an echo in generations. That means we live on 70. Yeah. Some people go, I could never do that. We'll start somewhere. God's God, that's a matter of obedience. Start with 2% seeding, 2% saving, and live on 86%. If you've got a lot of money, why wouldn't you live? 10% goes to the church, goes to God's house, 20% seeding, 20% saving, mm -hmm. and live on 50%. So the, it works everywhere. And I know I'm talking a lot, but I get pretty passionate because no, it's, it's huge. Been, it's really, I mean, this is life changing stuff. Uh, well, I pray it was, and the echo will be, because the echo back is exactly that. We have people in their 60s, 70s going, nobody taught me not to give everything away. <sighs> and for Marie and I, we actually felt dirty for a while to reduce our seeding so that we could work principally. And so we now, by God's grace, are living a 10, 20, 20, 50. That's fantastic. But we're living a principled way of living. Mm -hmm. And if God speaks, we'll do something in the moment based on faith. Otherwise, we need faith to live the principle. Yeah. And I would say to everyone, it doesn't matter where you're at, you can start reducing immediately your debt and start setting up your generations if you begin to say there is an answer. But it's more than just tithing. Tithing is honouring of God. It gets God's breath in us to be able to do the other things well, and we will get ahead. Would you unpack seeding a little more? Because I think a lot of people might think, okay, I get the tithing thing, but I'm not quite sure what you mean by seeding. For just a regular family watching this, where do they begin seeding? So I would say, okay, if, we, if God's word is true and the first tenth belongs to God, then start where you can. Uh, let's say, let's start 10 to 286. So 2%, you put 2% of your income aside. Many of people do it after tax for the seeding. So 2% would go there. And then that begins to mount up. And then you have a neighbor that needs something. Ah, uh, okay. You have a special building project that you want to give to. You've got missionaries you want to support. Whatever you feel to do, you've got money already set aside that you can be a blessing to. So we have children at life now who have four jars. And if they get $10 a month or $10 a week, they live at 10, 10, 10, 70. In their seating jar, they have a kid at school. They can buy lunch for them. They can give to special projects. They can help, again, other initiatives because it's already set aside. Not only that, whatever they're seeding, they're creating a harvest of equal value wow. that's going to go to their home and go to the generations that follow them. So that's how we work. It's kind of like... I was taught, you just sow and the harvest will come. And then yeah. I realised, no, a farmer goes and gets the harvest. That is what seeding and saving is all about. Wow. It's the ability to see things different and to take that principled faith approach. The thing I love about that is that sometimes when you hear of a need, you're suddenly like, oh, where, do, where am I going to get any money yeah. to? But if that becomes a part of the discipline part of your life, yeah. then it's there and you're able to respond quickly. Because that was the thing that Barry and I noticed when we were with your church, that they're a very generous family. Yeah. And, and I think that that speaks from the leadership down, that the people are learning to, to live generously, but yeah. not foolishly. No, because I, I think sometimes, and we certainly will like that, we were giving money away that we didn't have. Mm -hmm. 
because there's a great cause and this is the will yeah. of God and let's yeah. just do that. Whereas where we want people to get to is like, no, give away things you've put aside. Mm -hmm. So you're giving what you've built to that point and then you're not forfeiting your future, yeah. your living principle. And that's the thing. That's why I, I totally believe in tithing and stewarding. It brings God's blessing into our financial world, but it's only one ingredient. Then the seed is what creates a harvest, not mm -hmm. just for us. See, we, we often in church, we talk about seeding and it's all about our harvest. It's about the harvest that it creates for the kingdom wow. and also us. Then our saving is our security that is setting up the generations that follow. So we can experience the joy, enjoyment of getting debt down and then getting our own home, but that's going to go to our grandkids. So our grandkids all have an account. Uh, so every time I, we get paid, money goes into that account every week. They don't even know it. When they get married or 25, I think we've decided, they might know, but m might not have heard about it, but we've got an account for them. It's not to pay for their wedding, not to pay for holidays, honeymoon. It's to pay for their home on top of whatever else is there so they don't have to work their whole life trying to find this sufficiency. They're beginning to go, this is normal Christian living. And I would say to everyone, no matter where you're at, normal Christian living is 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Read it over and over and get a revelation that that's where God wants me to get to. And if I can help or we can help in any way, the, the God money in me will give you the pathway and undo some of these myths, which is money is bad and money is just going to come to you. I, I've said this to many people. If you pray and ask God for money, you really don't want his money. And people go, what do you mean? <laughs> because it won't have a serial number on it. <laughs> it. It needs something that comes from a human hand. Yeah. God has used somebody to make a difference. Wow. So we need to get practical and stay spiritual. But this thing that I wonder, when you as a church community at Life Church in New Zealand, how, what kind of impact does that type of living have on your community, on your business community, on those who are watching in? Yeah. It's amazing. So we're, we're 28 years now. This year, we will do close to $10 million worth of community impact. Wow. So as one church, we felt like we need to be the hands of Jesus. And so it's not like just give everything, don't give everything away. If God absolutely speaks to you, and he may do that a few times in life, but that's not every time there's need. Yeah. Live principally. And by the end of next year, our goal is that every calendar year, we as a church will give more than $20 million worth of community impact in our community. So we're not just known for church on Sunday, we're known for the difference of feeding people that are hungry, we're currently working on reforming foster care in New Zealand. The government's opened up the doors for that. We've got special needs homes. We've got educational facilities for people that can't get into the workforce. I think we've got 500 students in that at the moment. And the government just said we are producing more outcome than any other organisation nationally. And it's not look at what we're doing. It's just like if we can deal with the money issue, we can set up platforms where there is a paradigm shift of God at the centre of it all but God doesn't want us just to live in our here and now. Mm -hmm. He wants us to think about how do we live this generationally. Now, your book, God, Money and Me, um, fantastic. You can, um, we'll be glad to send it to you. You can get it on Amazon. But you have other resources as well. Don't you have like video teachings maybe for pastors who want yep. to start um, doing yep. this in their church? Well, I think, again, money is such a deep-rooted mm -hmm. issue. Uh, so we did do a five-week curriculum, which all of those weeks have a 22-minute video that I've put together that you can have your small group sit down. I can talk through the video. You can get it online, access it online. Fantastic. If they get the book, the book's written such a way there's five segments. They can answer the questions, go to group, hear another perspective and discuss it. That has begun to unlock. I'm not sure we make the shifts we, m we need to make just by preaching on Sunday. Yeah. I, I think we need to respond to it and communicate yeah. around it. Yeah. Wow. Um, again, I'll tell you how you can get hold of the book um, after this. But one of the great things is that when, when you begin to uh, use your money the way God intended, then you're able to reach out and touch the lives of so many. And I'm going to show you just one of the ways that we're very excited about doing that. Would you watch this? What, is he saying something? He says it's pain. It's pain? Yeah, for a minute. It's pain. <laughs> oh, my gosh. 
I'm in a village in Angola and came upon this child. This little boy's Augusto, and this breaks my heart. His little feet are in some of the worst shape I've ever seen. And there were many in this village with horrible conditions on their feet. But this little guy, he's, he's just scratching. They itch so bad. They're completely infected. He said there's insects that have gotten into his feet. I, I'll be surprised if he doesn't lose his toe. And then the disease comes in through their feet and just goes throughout their body. It can actually kill them all from going barefoot in conditions that we're in right here. I know Shoes and Smiles is a campaign that we get really excited about and it's fun, but this is why it's fun, because it saves lives. You would think just a pair of shoes is not life-saving, but in areas like this, in conditions like this, it is. And we can change it for Augusto. We can help him. We, we're going to clean these up and, and get him a pair of shoes and help him. Please do what you can. Help bring shoes to little children like Augusto all over the world. You can be a part of something big and something even fun. But this is the reason we do it. Please. You might wonder why we're starting a little bit early for Christmas, because we call this Christmas Shoes and Smiles, but it's simply because we want to get um, all the supplies in so that we can make sure that we get them sent out by Christmas. Our goal for this time is 150,000 children to be given um, the very first pair of shoes. And these amazing, I mean, these shoes, we get them for $3.60. And they're great, they last well when the children have to go into the water. Um, the water drains out and it protects their feet from these terrible diseases. And you can help. For $36, you can send 10 pairs of shoes. $72, 20 pairs. For 180, you can send 50 pairs of shoes. I so often think that in this nation, we get so caught up in self at Christmas time and we buy a bunch of stuff that we don't need and we don't want. Wouldn't it be amazing to be able to sit around on Christmas morning and, and know that there's children running around with shoes on for the first time in their life. There's a lot of mums out there. I met them the last time I was there in Angola who are praying not for a new iPhone for their kid. What they simply want is, is a pair of shoes and you can do that. And the other thing that, um, that Barry and I are doing this year for Christmas for each other is that we have some amazing doctors who will perform um, cleft palate surgery, cleft lip or cleft palate. And in some of these nations, when a child is born that way, there's superstition. They're, they're looked on as if they're cursed by God, which we know is not right. But some of these amazing doctors from the States will go and do these surgeries and they'll do one for $500. Wouldn't that be a great gift to give to your significant other for Christmas rather than one more sweater or another pair of shoes they don't really need? We can make such a difference this Christmas season to children all around the world who are just longing to know, does anybody even know that we are alive? So would you go to your phone? Would you dial the number on your screen? Would you give the very best gift possible? And you know that every Christmas we'll come out with a new little shoe for your Christmas tree. Um, this year, uh, it's green. For any gift at all, we'll send you that. And if you're able to give $100, then we have three of them from the last two years. We have the crystal one, we have the green, and we have the red. And I know you don't do it for that. It's just our way of saying thank you. And also when you see that hanging on your tree, it's a lovely thing to think that there is a child with their very first pair of shoes. So we can do this together, 150,000 children, if we do this together. So please go to your phone, give the best gift possible, and let's bring some joy with Christmas shoes and smiles. Poverty is a killer. And because of it, children needlessly suffer, not only from a lack of food and clean water, but also from a lack of things we often take for granted, like a simple pair of shoes. Far too many children living in extreme poverty have never owned a new pair of shoes. And while that may seem minor in light of all their needs, walking with bare feet puts them at risk of life-threatening infections and disease that could lead to crippling consequences and even death. By responding today, you can help immediately secure and begin shipping Christmas shoes to 150,000 children around the world, just in time for the holidays. 
Your gift of $36 will help provide 10 pairs of shoes. A gift of $72 will provide 20 pair. And a gift of $180 will help provide 50 pairs of Christmas shoes for children in need. As a thank you for your gift of support, be sure to request this beautifully crafted green crystal shoe ornament, a treasure to display at each Christmas. With your gift of $100 or more, you may also request this keepsake boxed set of life's Christmas shoe ornaments. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,000 or more to help provide over 275 pairs of shoes or two children with corrective cleft palate surgeries. And you may request the beautiful Safe in the Shepherd's Arms bronze sculpture. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I gotta tell you what a happy day this is for me. You know, I'm, I'm here with 20 kids who've all received shoes today because someone like you was generous enough to say, I'll give $72, or maybe two of you gave $36. And that gift of $36 meant that 10 or $72 meant that 20 children got shoes here today. Maybe you could go even further. Maybe you can give an extra special gift. What that would mean is you would extend this line just that much further. You would extend the expression of God's heart and His hands to these children, and you would extend the joy in villages just like this. Please, do it today. Get online or dial that number on your screen and give, give a gift, an extra special, above normal gift that is the gift of shoes, the gift of joy. Thank you so much, and the lines are busy. Please write the number down and keep calling till you get through. And uh, Paul, I wanna thank you so much. I know that you just literally got here from New Zealand, but the fact that you would take time out to be with us, and this is a fantastic book. I'm so grateful for it. Well, we're praying that every person finds a pathway mm -hmm. to financial freedom, that there is a way in God, that he has everything covered. We just need to understand it, yeah. implement it. Yeah. Awesome. So um, for any gift at all too, we will send you Paul's book, God, Money and Me. And I know I'm, I got a copy from my, from my son, but my husband and I, are, we're going through it at the moment and making a few adjustments <laughs> in ours. But I just know it'll be such a, it's such a gift to you and it will really set you free to be able to live the way that God wants you to live in real financial freedom. So for James and Betty for Life Today, thanks so much for being with us and we'll see you next time on Life Today. Within four hours of submitting the final manuscript of their marriage book, Empty, Winter Pitts passed away from a heart failure. Tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.